Sir Charles Snarls, Stanford's British Reputation Between the Wars. Hello, I'm Robert James Stove. Armistice Day 1918. At the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, the bloodiest and most frightful conflict which Europe had yet seen finally ended. H. G. Wells had over-optimistically called it the War to End War. So many novels and so many poems have attempted to do justice to that day, but rather than quoting any of the best-known instances, I'd like to offer a few words from a memoir by the historian Sir Charles Petrie, who was an eyewitness to the Armistice Day celebrations in London. These words include a singularly grim joke concerning the former German emperor, which I've never seen anywhere else. Petrie writes as follows. The king and queen received an ovation as they drove through the packed streets. Older people recalled Mafeking Night. An old gentleman asked a policeman the quickest way to Charing Cross Hospital. Call for three cheers for the Kaiser! was the immediate reply. As I was going home on the district railway, a rather drunken workman got into the carriage and kept on repeating, We've won the bloody war, but we'll lose the bloody peace. You see if we don't. In vino veritas? Unquote. For Sir Charles Villiers Stanford, the period between Armistice Day and his own death in 1924 was consistently sad. Two of Stanford's students, George Butterworth and Ernest Farrow, had been killed on the Western Front. Politics exacerbated the misery caused by Stanford's physical decline, a decline unaccompanied by any enfeebling of his cognitive powers. Belatedly, in 1921, Trinity College Dublin offered Stanford an honorary doctorate. Alas, his obedience to doctor's orders and his dread of being caught in military crossfire amid the Anglo-Irish War kept him in England, so the college withdrew its offer rather than grant him the doctorate in absentia. Home rule for Ireland, soon followed by civil conflagration, represented the triumph of all the forces that Stanford had opposed throughout his adult life. One wonders whether, contemplating the fratricidal mayhem which disfigured the land of his birth, Stanford ever thought of W. B. Yeats's famous and prophetic lines, Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. What we do know for certain is that on three occasions during the last eight years of his life, Stanford went to the headquarters of the gramophone company, afterwards called HMV, at Hayes in Middlesex. There he recorded almost an hour's worth of his own music. All of these recordings turned up in 1974 on an LP issued by the Pearl label, which specialised in such archival releases. The chances are that Stanford, with his persistent shortage of money, undertook these recordings chiefly for financial reward. It's unlikely that he enjoyed the experience. Until well past 1900, many musicians continued to dismiss the gramophone itself as a mere toy, soulless, without musical purpose and able to please only those whom Vincent Dandy ex expressively called une majorité des snob idiotes. Given the limits of recording technology back then, the so-called symphony orchestra, which is credited on the label for many of the Stanford pieces, wouldn't have been a symphony orchestra at all. Moreover, several of the pieces needed to be severely cut in order to observe the constraints of 4 minutes 78 rpm sides. When in 1923 Stanford conducted the London Symphony Orchestra, or rather conducted part of the London Symphony Orchestra, and the Australian bass baritone Harold Williams in the Songs of the Fleet 
at least Stanford's actual music was unabridged, but no recording equipment at the time could cope with a whole choir as well as the instrumental forces. Therefore, the choral passages in this performance were all reassigned to an unidentified male quartet. Stanford can hardly have welcomed the barbershop timbre that all too often results, and that proves especially ruinous to the Parsifal-like splendor of the cycle's A-flat major finale. Altogether, the outcome inspires keen disappointment at the discographic opportunity which music lovers lost because of Stanford having died when he did. If he had lived just two years more, he could have benefited, as Elgar benefited, from the substantial improvements in sound quality that electric recording brought with it from 1925. The two biggest compositions of Stanford's last years were his final opera, The Travelling Companion, and his gigantic 67-minute setting of the Latin Mass, written in thanksgiving for the Allied victory in the Great War. It's typical of Stanford's post-1918 fortunes that neither work achieved performance in Stanford's lifetime, except for the Gloria movement from the Latin Mass, which did get a hearing. The rest of the Latin Mass wasn't heard anywhere until two years ago in Cardiff. Publishing firms, which once had been happy to issue Stanford's output, now exhibited in their adjudications no overwhelming desire to spare his sensibilities. A bleak 1922 letter from an agent whom Stanford had hired is unusual solely in the bluntness of its language. Quote, I very much regret to say that although I have now offered your manuscripts entitled Concert Pieces for Solo, Organ Solo, actually, it was a single concert piece for organ and orchestra, which makes one wonder about the agent's competence. In several likely quarters, not one of the publishers to whom I have submitted them has seen his way to make me any proposal for their publication. Under these circumstances, and as I do not see any immediate prospect of my being successful in effecting a sale, I have decided reluctantly that I had better return the manuscripts to you. You will be interested to know that since you were good enough to place the manuscripts in my hands, they have been submitted to the following publishers. Messrs. Augner Limited, Messrs. Novello, Messrs. Enoch and Son, Messrs. Joseph Williams, Messrs. Metzler and Co., Messrs. J.B. Cramer and Co. Limited, Messrs. Stainer and Bell, Messrs. Boozy and Co. Again, regretting that in this particular instance, my efforts on your behalf should not have been attended with success, I am, yours sincerely, H. Ward. Sensible parents appreciate the wisdom behind the famous bumper sticker which reads, Be nice to your kids, they'll choose your nursing home. The analogous advice to creators afflicted with Stanford's habitual truculence would be, be nice to your composition students, they'll be your publisher's readers. I'm sure a lot of those assessors who rejected Stanford's new work were ex-students of his, getting their revenge on his bad temper. One of Stanford's former pupils, Arthur Bliss, really let his old teacher have it in the neck. Shortly after the war, Stanford issued a rather cantankerous essay called On Some Recent Tendencies in Composition, which he based on a public lecture and later reprinted in book form. In this essay, Stanford sniped at consecutive fifths as well as the whole tone scale. Bliss chastised him in a later issue of the magazine where the essay had originally appeared. An extract from Bliss's reprimand follows. Incidentally, it comes complete with a politically incorrect reference to African Americans, so be warned. Quote, I was very glad to pick up Sir Charles Stanford's paper, read to this association over two years ago, and published now in his book, Interludes, in which he puts the case against much of the new music. Coming from one of the greatest European teachers, his arguments are potent and weighty, and yet, as a member of a new generation, I feel I have the right to reply, even if only on the ground that, being Irish, he will not resent an honest antagonist. Like the N-word related in Walter Page's Life and Letters, he may even welcome a hit back, unquote. 
Bliss then goes on to recount a protracted and remarkably unfunny anecdote about a quarrel between two African Americans, whom he identifies as N-word number one and N-word number two. The relevance of this anecdote to Stanford is not immediately obvious. Afterwards, Bliss, who's depicted here, or possibly here, makes the following complaint about Stanford. The first sign he, Stanford, sees of the retrogression of modern music is the, according to him, prevalent love of writing fifths consecutively. This writing of fifths is a bugbear that haunts the musician in his cradle, dogs him at all his examinations, and often leads him to any sort of stilted contrapuntal passage in order to avoid them. Some acoustical authority declared they were ugly, the avoidance of them became a rule, and it is still cherished, although the air has so developed, thanks to the composers, that it delights in consecutive seconds, sevenths, ninths, twenty-firsts, in fact, in anything that it can conceive will further adorn any particular passage. Every master broke this rule at the bidding of his own ear, and so will every master continue to break it." Unquote. That last sentence would have confirmed Stanford's worst suspicions about Bliss's historical literacy. So would Bliss's subsequent crowing about tonality's future, or rather, lack thereof. Quote, he, Stanford, mentions, in addition to the consecutive fifths and the whole tone scale, the tendency to overcrowding modulation. But what does he mean by that? Modulation presumes a basis of key system. And generally, throughout Europe, we find the principle of polytonality or atonality superseding the old key system. We can point to the Schoenberg School in Vienna, the Busoni School in Berlin, the Savinsky and Mio School in Paris, not to speak of Gussens and Berners in London. What on earth has modulation got to do with it? His statement leaves one as aghast as if Copernicus appeared to the Royal Astronomical Society and accused them of thinking the Earth flat. Unquote. At least Bliss, for all the arrogance implicit in his tomorrow belongs to me attitude, showed Stanford the courtesy of taking his arguments with some seriousness. Not so Philip Heseltine, alias Peter Warlock, who, as editor-in-chief of the Sackbart, had attacked Stanford in 1921. With uncharacteristic caution, as well as, no doubt, equally uncharacteristic fear of libel laws, Heseltine, alias Warlock, hid on this occasion behind the pseudonym Barbara C. Larent. Thereby safeguarded, he wrote his whole article in a spirit of ridicule, as extracts indicate. Quote, Sir Charles Snarls, hence the title of my talk. To go on, there was something quite pathetically fatuous about Sir Charles Stanford's recent address to the Musical Association. When it was announced that the venerable professor was to read a paper on some recent tendencies in composition, we knew we were in for some fun, but we did not anticipate a more perfect caricature of a pedant proper than could be devised by the most malicious of his critics. No contemporary names were mentioned. Modern music was just an aggregate. Even as one might say, old music can vaguely include anything but between Pythagoras and Purcell. Two of its chief characteristics were an inordinate love of consecutive fifths, with the suggestion that modern composers wrote them merely because they had been told not to do so, the dirty dogs, and an excessive use of the whole tone scale. It is scarcely credible in the face of 20th century musical practice that consecutive fifths can still be seriously discussed where actual composition is concerned. Why, even old Tom Moore wondered whether there might not be some pedantry in adhering to the rule which forbids them, and that was nearly a hundred years ago. It's probably true that Stanford had not closely studied the avant-garde of the early 20th century. An overabundance of consecutive fifths would be the last charge which he or anybody else could have levelled at, for instance, Pierrot Lunaire. Inasmuch as Stanford had shown vagueness when naming his targets, and should probably have been more precise about whom he was censuring, Heseltine slash Warlock had a point.
but the glee with which the article proceeds to assail the Royal Musical Association's chairman, as well as assailing Stanford, indicates on the author's part a visceral aversion rather than an intellectual scruple. Quote, Sir Frederick Bridge, chairman, then came out with the shameless admission that in the old days he could settle down comfortably in his armchair by the fireside with a good cigar, no harm in that, and read the score of a musical composition, whereas now, on the other hand, when he turned to the scores of the young fellows of the present time, he found he couldn't do it any more. Rounds of applause and roars of delighted laughter, the utter inferiority of contemporary music being thus incontestably proved. No, it is not a dream, but an exceedingly disagreeable reality, which makes one realise more clearly than ever that music has no more poisonous enemy than the musical profession. Nevertheless, despite the best efforts of Bliss and Heseltine slash Warlock, when Stanford did die in March 1924, most British newspapers and music magazines were suitably deferential. The London Times, then and long afterwards printed on broadsheets, devoted a column and a half to paying Stanford obituary homage, freely using the word genius in its headline and body texts. There was similarly generous media coverage of the elaborate funeral ceremony for Stanford at Westminster Abbey, not just within the London press, but also in the Evening Telegraph printed in Dundee. It's interesting and unexpected to note the sheer profusion of gramophone recordings devoted to Stanford's music between the wars. By 1939, the Stanford discography was already reaching respectable proportions. The chances are that this fact reflected popular tastes, given how fantastically expensive any gramophone recording was relative to the typical worker's purchasing power in Britain before the 1960s. Such products' sheer cost militated against uninformed impulse buying. In 1925, a complete recording of Elgar's Second Symphony cost almost half the average weekly wage, which was five pounds, to purchase. I suspect that with Stanford, as with Puccini and Tchaikovsky at the same period, critical opprobrium had no impact whatsoever on the general public's enthusiasm. You might think that most early Stanford discs would have been of his Anglican church music, but such was not at all the case. Instead, Stanford's secular vocal output predominated, and more especially his secular vocal output with Irish subject matter. Several of the most popular singers of the age, notably Peter Dawson and John McCormack, included songs by Stanford on their records as well as in their recitals. Following the Second World War, Kathleen Ferrier did the same thing. BBC Radio was commendably diligent about publicising, during the interwar years, another important area of Stanford's output, namely his organ works. This table, derived from trawling through Radio Times back numbers, shows just how many live broadcasts of Stanford's organ music there were then. Here's one area where apparent public interest didn't translate into the slightest gramophonic interest, because I've not discovered a single commercial recording of any Stanford organ work made before 1965. But the broadcasting tally is impressive. Sadly, the very year of Stanford's demise, 1924, witnessed Cecil Gray in his influential book, A Survey of Contemporary Music, treating Stanford Parry and other British musicians with obstreperous contempt. Quote, in the same way that Stanford and Perry provided us with second-hand Brahms, Cyril Scott provides us with imitation Debussy, Joseph Holbrook and Sir Granville Bantock have followed Strauss, and in the music of Gussens, Bliss and Lord Berners, we find our English Ravel, Stravinsky and Satie. In every generation it has been the same thing, only the models have changed. 
the outcome of their combined efforts like that of their forerunners is precisely nil unquote. after stanford had died the process of trying to cut him down to size continued the gramophone's initial editor sir compton mackenzie novelist memoirist actor broadcaster champion croquet player siamese cat breeder and spy not to mention nicotine addict to judge by this photo devo devoted the opening section of gramophone's october 1925 editorial to championing elgar against the latter's rivals including stanford quote elgar's renown has been pinched i think that must have been a misprint for pitched between two schools on the one hand the pedantic or perhaps I should say the pedagogic tradition which has haunted English music for the last 50 years and which found its least unvital exponent in Stanford depreciated him because he went too far for their gentlemanly taste, unquote. That bit about its least unvital exponent would have to be the least unstupid double negative I've seen in decades. 32 years later, Mackenzie, in yet another gramophone editorial, reminisced as follows. By this date, 1941, Stanford was so infernally disagreeable to younger men that I should not have felt the slightest indignation, however badly Elgar behaved towards Stanford. Unquote. The piling on process continued with the publication in 1943 of Sir Arnold Bax's autobiography. Bax's attack on Stanford added to the existing charges of undue conservatism the charge of national treachery. I quote, Stanford was not Irish enough. An Irishman by birth, he belonged to that class abominated by Irish Ireland, the West Britain. There are intimations in some of his work that he started not without a certain spark of authentic musical imagination, but quite early he went a whoring after foreign gods, and that original flicker was smothered in the outer darkness of Brahms. Unquote. Even those who, unlike Bax and unlike Cecil Gray, continued to esteem Stanford, tended to treat him persistently as a teacher who happened to compose rather than as a composer who happened to teach. This annoyed the composer's son, Guy Stanford, a good deal, and Guy rightly complained at one point that, in published accounts of his father, quote, far too much emphasis has been given to his teaching and far too little to his composition, unquote. To a certain extent, Guy's complaint about his father's treatment is still justified today. With Baxter's comment, we've already reached World War II, and I'm all too conscious that I'll soon be running out of time. Thus, in conclusion, let me give you a roundup of the considerable improvement in Stanford's reputation, which occurred after 1945. Recently, I was astonished to discover that Stanford had a post-war following in, of all places, Norway. At the 1953 Bergen Music Festival in that country, two local conductors directed some of Stanford's sacred choral works, though media coverage of the festival leaves unclear precisely which of his sacred choral works audiences heard. Believe it or not, the New York Times sent its chief music critic, Olin Downs, to Norway to cover that festival. Can you imagine any newspaper doing that these days? Nonetheless, as so often happens in music, it took a big anniversary to improve the public awareness of Stanford's achievements. In Stanford's case, the big anniversary was 1952, the centenary of his birth. There were various Stanford-related BBC radio broadcasts on what was then termed the third programme. The Radio Times marked the Stanford centenary with a short article by pianist Harold Rutland. Two distinguished former students of Stanford, Vaughan Williams and Herbert Howells, 
both delivered commemorative lectures about their old teacher, which subsequently appeared in print. Howells, in his turn, received a poignant homage from Guy Stanford at Westminster Abbey, where, on the 30th of September 1952, the exact centenary day, Howells and Vaughan Williams placed wreaths at the composer's tomb. Guy Stanford put on Howells's finger a ring which he himself had been bequeathed by his father. Incongruously enough, given Stanford's political conservatism, this ring had once belonged to the notorious regicidal French revolutionist Philippe Duke of Orléans, Philippe Egalité as he became known, who'd left the ring to his daughter. His daughter had escaped to Ireland while the reign of terror raged in France. Somehow, the ring eventually came into the possession of an uncle of Stanford, who willed it to Charles Villiers, who willed it to Guy. Alas, I've yet to find out what happened to the ring after Howells himself died in 1983. I'd like to finish up today with words which Vaughan Williams uttered on BBC Radio during a 1952 commemoration lecture. Words that are eloquent in their simplicity. On that occasion, Vaughan Williams said this. He, Stanford, has written some of the most beautiful music that has come from these islands. The bright young things of the younger generation do not seem to know much about Stanford, and not having had the advantage of his teaching, are inclined to ignore what he did and what he taught. But I believe that he will return again. With the next generation, the inevitable reaction will set in, and Stanford will come into his own. Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much.